So good morning to you all. Uh, a warm welcome to all of you, some of you in-house and some of you at home, some far away from here, I'm sure. Um, this session is about dynamic visions of adding value to go beyond healthcare service delivery. And we will have seven speakers sharing with us their knowledge and their experiences. We are going to start with Walt Vernon, uh, that I ask to be on stage, please. Um, he is Chief Executive Officer at Mazetti University, oh, Mazetti, United States, it's not a university. Uh, he leads a US-based healthcare facilities consulting firm uh, and nonprofit sextant as well. Walt's career has been dedicated to driving healthcare to better outcomes. He, is also, he also represents the UES to the International Federation of Healthcare Engineers and the WHO Help Desk response to the COVID crisis. Thank you very much for your presentation that will be about National Academy of Medicine position on climate and healthcare. Okay, thank you. The clock has started. I promise to be finished in 10 minutes. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to speak today a little bit about some work that's being done in the U.S. around the issue of climate and health. Um, and, and this is certainly in some ways indirect. And we, we've talked about it to uh, some degree here in this conference so far. Um, but in the United States, we have what are called the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. And these three organizations work together to bring together the top scientific engineering and healthcare minds in the country to really make uh, change possible in a needed way. This week, uh, or I guess it was last week, in preparation for the COP26 meeting, these are the three presidents of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and, and Medicine, um, and issued this joint call for uh, uh, progress at COP26. And maybe more important, um, the National Academy of Medicine, which is sort of near and dear to our hearts here, right, uh, has issued um, a call to decarbonize the healthcare sector. And in, in the US, of course, in many ways, we are laggards in, in the decarbonizing movement and somewhat erratic. But I think it's really encouraging that at the National Academy of Medicine, we are beginning to focus on how do we improve health of our global commons? Because without that, none of the rest of it matters in some way, right? And so uh, the, the National Academy of Medicine has launched what they're calling an action collaborative. And in Historically, the National Academies have been organizations that would create uh, nice reports that few people would read. And what the current leadership is trying to do is to transcend that and not just write a report, but bring people together in a way that mobilizes the energy of the collective and moves us forward to create needed change. And so um, I am fortunate to serve on the um, steering committee for the Action Collaborative. And I wrote this document, so this is supposed to be a paper presentation. This document I think is available on the, um, on the International Hospital Federation website. Uh, this was a background paper for helping the National Academy to launch the initiative into how to decarbonize the healthcare system in the US. And, and in some ways, ideally, to begin to connect with the similar decarbonization efforts going on around the world, both so that we can uh, share what we learn and learn from the rest of the world and together make needed progress. I will say the, the, the way that we're looking at this and, and how we decarbonize, we've sort of thought about, I, I, I'm an engineer, so I come from the world of design. I'm not a healthcare provider in a sense. I'm a healthcare provider in the sense that I create public health. Um, which is in many ways the, the roots of engineering. But we, we thought about how we design a healthcare system that is inherently less carbon intensive than uh, uh, our traditional way of, of carbon or of, of delivering healthcare. One of our um, 
co-authors is a gentleman named Don Berwick. Don famously wrote a document called the 100,000, uh, to err is human, you may remember. A number of years ago, uh, there was a report written that said we kill 100,000 people in the United States due to preventable medical errors. And he created through this a whole movement around healthcare quality in the United States. And he defined healthcare quality as having six, six dimensions. Everything from timeliness to safety to effectiveness. And he will say today, he was one of my co-authors on this report, that it is now time to add a seventh dimension to the way we think about clinical outcomes and clinical quality, and that is embodied carbon. We need to be thinking about how do we design the way we deliver health services in a way that is less carbon intensive as possible. And so that's sort of a starting point, is rethinking how we design health delivery systems. Our second dimension to uh, responding to this is once we know what uh, it looks like to deliver carbon reduced health care, what does that mean for the uh, infrastructure that supports health care delivery, whether it's buildings, transportation, or physical objects, right? The, the, the carbon embodied in everything we touch. How do we start to decarbonize all of that? And so there's sort of a separate then track that's starting to focus on how do we decarbonize all of that. That is in some ways a well-trodden ground. M many people have been working in particular on the buildings issue and transportation, but we're um, really thinking about how to accelerate that through the health delivery system. And finally, we're looking at uh, a series of metrics and how do we start to define the clinical, the embodied carbon in clinical outcomes as a way to measure progress uh, and set up benchmarking and, um, and frankly policy and financing tools. The problem we have, of course, is that the healthcare system, especially in the United States, is a very uh, disaggregated group of businesses um, and, and entities that interact in complex ways. And as we face the problem of climate change, the urgency of action is intense and, and we cannot wait. And so the need for speed is very, very high. And, and at the same time, we have such immensity of scale of the problem that, that these two things run into each other. And there is a danger often that, that uh, things that need to be tried may not be perfect immediately when implemented, right? Um, there was a, um, uh, a, a, one of the, I'm from the state of California, and we have our California Energy Commission, and one of the leaders of that group, was they, somebody was talking to him about, aren't you trying to go too fast, right? California is trying to do a lot of climate things, and often the things we do, that they aren't perfectly designed so that everything goes well and nothing goes wrong, right? Because we're trying to move very fast. And they asked him, aren't you trying to go too fast? And he said, you know, the danger of going too slow is much worse than the danger of going too fast. And that's the problem we face in healthcare today. With this climate emergency, we must be moving and there isn't time to wait. So speed and scale are our our challenges. The things that we're working on at the National Academy right now and, and trying to start to move the health sector in a positive uh, climate direction, first is this idea of metrics and targets and goals. Um, we're really starting to look at uh, carbon in sort of different ways. His historically, when, I, I, again, I'm an engineer, in the, in the engineering world, we think about how much energy per square meter or per square foot of a building, right? We try to think in those kinds of terms because that's the way engineers think. But what we're starting to look at in the US now is how do we start to think about carbon per patient day or carbon per patient encounter or carbon per covered life? How can we start to measure the effectiveness of what we're doing in terms of the, the delivery, because that's what matters. We wanna make sure that we don't um, diminish quality at the same time that we're diminishing carbon. So we're creating those metrics and we should have those, I think, next year um, that we will start to implement. The second thing we're doing at the National Academy is trying to create motivation within the sector, a recognition, right? Historically, the healthcare industry has thought 
that it isn't our job to deal with the climate. That's somebody else's problem. That's the utilities, that's the engineers, that's energy people, that's something else, right? We, our job is to take care of this patient here and now. And uh, a, a big part of what we're doing at the National Academy is awakening the industry to the moral imperative that we have as healthcare delivery people uh, to answer this call. And not only to answer the call, but to be the leaders in our communities that our communities need to make the needed transition. So the second thing we're doing is this idea of motivation. The third thing that we're doing is working on policy. We're working closely with the federal government, our Department of Health and Human Services, and uh, you know, President Biden likes to say we're back and I hope we're here for good now. And so we're working very hard to put policy into place that starts to decarbonize our healthcare sector. And we're really starting to focus on some very specific things where we can bring together the power of the three national academies, engineering, science, and medicine, to create rapid improvement in various ways of, of doing things. And so, uh, so much I wish I could talk to you about, but my time is effectively up. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here and invite people with questions to reach out to me. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we could have had two minutes more if you wanted. You said number okay. one. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for, very much for highlighting such an important topic. Our next speaker is Marta Sanchez Brett. Um, has been leading public and private initiatives within the health sector as cluster manager during the last four years. She is mental health cluster manager at Mental Health Cluster Catalonia, Spain. Um, she attained a master's degree in chemistry mm -hmm. at the Universita de Barcelona yeah. and an MBA from ESEAD both in Spain. Yeah. So uh, she is uh, now uh, talking about mental health cluster 2021 projects and initiatives. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. So I would like to present you our project today, CALL, Care and Autonomy Living Lab. CALL is an initiative born inside our cluster organization as a unique opportunity to gather all the knowledge of the different visions we have as a living ecosystem, to approach and tackle care and autonomy challenges from a user perspective. We help to develop technology as a support, a support that enables citizenships and policymakers to make social inclusion a closer reality. We have prepared a short video that summarizes the main ideas of this project. I think it might be dynamic enough. Let's see.
Okay, so I hope it was dynamic enough to this session. <laughs> uh, as seen, uh, we, we are working in an open innovation tool focused on the development of neuroscience, mental health, and silver economy solutions. It's a hybrid space for co-creation in real life context. And up to now, the classic methodology to solve health and social challenges uh, has always been approached in independently by single disciplines like medicine or politics. But the complexity, the transversality, and the inherent chronicity that accompany the central nervous system affections of a person in a whole life cycle, we believe that co-creation is really a need. With this view, COL hosts technological and social innovation projects with uh, the following uh, methodology steps. In step one, uh, we are embedded in our ecosystem, so we start already with known and analyzed sectorial challenges. Then we move forward to identify the user needs, with uh, including the user as a protagonist on a cross-cutting approach together with the <coughs> stakeholders. Moving to co-creation, step three, we, we start doing what we call living lab days. In the living lab days, we arise together challenges and needs previously established to match the ideas. This allows the incorporation of technological tools such as artificial intelligence, virtual reality, big data, among any other exponential technologies through, that we find out through uh, technology scouting. Step four and five, we prototype and test products if necessary, approaching at the same time market strategy, market, market strategy in iterative cycles. What makes Living Lab relevant is the interdisciplinary view among the different agents working in real environments and testing common solutions. So patients, community, researchers, as seen in the video, are the same as place, collaborating and assuming more than one role. From that view, we believe Living Lab is a useful tool for a cluster to make the whole ecosystem tangible and uh, releasing the deliverables. Hi, sorry. So, aims. There is a human resources shortage. We talk about pandemic's effect. A private sector too fragmented in some countries. It all has been stated during this uh, Congress, these days. So governments cannot afford alone the cost of healthcare public programs and their corresponding sustainability. So there positively exists a whole private sector willing to step up with new business models that could fit in the system through public-private collaborations to deliver effective and secure results. Trends in healthcare uh, has shown us that collaborative work with a multidisciplinary approach and holistic views are key topics to fix the challenges. So we as a cluster move towards an integrated concept of health and care, ser and care service models inside the community with a social, clear social view. The lab proposes value-driven system transformation supported by applied research, technology transfer, and innovation adoption in many different things, products, services, process improvement, and specifically social innovation. Here's where the living lab perfectly fits. Thus, from a business model perspective, we are able to define five areas where the lab develops contents and services. We have already talked about co-creation and usability tests before, so we think that communication networking is in the middle because health and social worlds are so, so far and so close at the same time that building effective communication in between the silos is key to assure successful project implementation for social integration in personal autonomy. For dissemination purposes, we have, uh, uh, from the cluster, we have created our own dissemination magazine, which is called Brains, for business, research, innovation, neuroscience, and social. On the training box, the, the lab identifies and develops training programs um, and courses delivered with and for professionals. And we, are, we have created as well our own digital platform called Mine Excellence. By consulting, we help companies to merge their activity into the challenges and create a collaborative frame with hospitals, academia, and third sector. We have stated up to now that the innovative con contribution to policy practice and research of the Living Lab in terms of knowledge, society, and business, the three uh, angles of this triangle. From the knowledge perspective, we can impact upstream in the, in the transfer value chain. 
The implication of the academy in living lab projects makes it possible to increase the knowledge base related to experimentation, both in terms of diversity and scope. In this regard, we relied on our university's research center and more than 20 scientific groups involved in the TechSAM network, technology and mental health. The TechSAM network is a common initiative from hospitals and Joan de Deu and funded by Agaur and European funds together with the cluster, with the idea to go upstream in, technology, in technological transfer. From business perspective, the involvement of companies regarding proximity to communities of users, public service and research institutions within living labs provides the opportunities to address questions in a different manner, economically, legally and ethically, to maximize the impact of innovation in a specific market or territory, which is in our case, Catalonia. It also favors transfer of knowledge and the cluster brings together companies from different activities and sizes interesting in participating. To society, the living lab model enables the notions of trust, reciprocity, connectivity, and multiple perspectives, which are fundamental in co-creative innovation. The third sector organizations, associations, patient and relative, as well as public administration, participate as well. In fact, city councils, county councils, foundations, or patients associations are a distinguished group of members of our cluster ecosystem. They are present since the foundation of the entity and they, are, um, they give additional return in social innovation projects. We can talk more in later after if you would like to know more about this type of projects. Findings, sorry, findings. Our key performance indicators. We, are more, uh, we have more than 100 projects arise up to now since 2013. The growing number of training sessions follow, follow the number of participants and trainees, as well as the increased number of associates and partners, they are coming from inside and outside the health sector. Historically, as seen in the video, we traced our roots in San Boy de Llobregat and the city holds for more than a century the knowledge and the care of all of those suffering from mental health disorders. The creation and the evolution of the mental health cluster then, it's a business case itself by which we had been able to measure the economical data and its impact. Playing as a unique mental health cluster in the world, our vision is to become a national and international reference in the development of collaborative initiatives in the fields of mental health, neuro and aging to improve the biopsychosocial support to all those who suffer from mental health disorder, affection and aging. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. And this session continues with a tale of two transformations, trans people and health systems sharing the pathway towards an integrated model of care by Dr. Ramon Escurier. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> He is the coordinator of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Program at the Catal Catalan Health System, lecturer of the School of Health Sciences, Blanquerna, uh, University Ramon Lu, principal investigator and at the research group, <laughs> and several other uh, activities, very important <laughs> activities. The floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your presentation and also thank you for inviting us to present our model of care. So, uh, what we are going to present now is not only me, it's all the team that we work with uh, this. Is uh, Our paper will be the model of care. You want to take your mask off? Yes, Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Much appreciated. So, uh, as I said, our paper will be the implementation of this model of care, which is a document. But it's not only a document, uh, so it's here. It's not only a document, it's, a, it's the way we provide care to trans people in the, what shall I do? Ah, the micro. Sorry. Um, it's the way that we provide uh, health care to trans people with this their specific needs and also the normal needs that any 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 person can can have 
So we have a background. We have in the health system, we started in 2008 with uh, an hospital-based uh, model of care, uh, which was uh, reviewed, you will see now, uh, because that was focused on the pathology and it's, it, it should be reviewed. So, and the people, the trans people uh, told us that that needed to be reviewed and uh, the focus of, the, of this model of care. So in 2012, uh, based on community and community health services, it was created this survey transit, which is uh, community-based and uh, is in the primary health system. So that was only one in that moment, uh, based in here in Barcelona. And they started to work with trans people, basically with uh, hormonal therapy, and also companions, accompaniment during the, all the transition. And then, uh, well, I have to say that in 2008, we did also make a body surgical modification. But in 2017, we contracted two more hospitals. So we have now three hospitals for this body surgical modification. Uh, also a political level, we have one law uh, supporting this model of care. And then we have a resolution of the Parliament of Catalonia in which they, um, they propose to review and to define a new model of care uh, for our community. So I also have to say that this is not a regular uh, provision of the national health system in Spain. It's an additional provision that we provide here in Catalonia. And also, I think some two more communities do this provision of care. So why we say this is a transformation? Uh, we say that because it changed, completely changed the, the way we had the relationship with the stakeholders, specifically with the platform of associations of trans people. They came to the administration, they asked for the review of the model, and we had to learn how to make this review together from the first step with them. So the document that you will see now with these key elements means that we have to agree all the things that are included in this model of care. So we have to conciliate sometimes our possibilities within the health system and their needs. Another thing, uh, so this is based in a, in a, in a participation model. So that was completely new for us. And also I have to say that from that point, we started to invite them, not only for this, but for example, when we reviewed also, updated the protocol for childbirth, we have trans people, men, that are giving birth. And we did not consider that in our protocols, but now we consider that. We invite them every time we update a new protocol, a new document, we invite them to, to give their opinion and to work with us in these updatings. So we moved from a pathological way, a pathological view, to a saluto salutogenic, salutogenic approach. So we are now in this, in this process. It has not finished, it's dynamic. So we are having a follow-up um, uh, follow um, coordination meetings with, with them. And another thing that we have uh, made from these from this, uh, lessons learned from this uh, collaboration is that we had to also train health professionals to explain them the needs of trans people, how do they want to be cared and how do they want to be uh, attended to. Uh, also, we made, well, they made that, but uh, in, in the hospitals that are doing the body, mod body uh, surgical modification, uh, they made sessions for all staff uh, just to inform and to uh, explain them how to treat and how to receive trans people when they come for the modi um, uh, surgical modification. And also we are now preparing a training course. You will see the model and, and this is the explanation. So we need people sensitive to be prepared 
to uh, receive and to treat and to attend and to do this companionship dur during all the transition, not only in these points, but in the whole health system. So we have prepared um, a training module and we will start with that in uh, now this next month. So well, I think this is, um, I have explained that. So we created a, this working group and now we are having follow-up uh, meetings with the implementation of the model, uh, but also we had, we needed uh, the instruction how to implement this model in the health system. So that's why from the Catalan Health Service, it was made an instruction, a specific instruction, stating how this model had to be implemented. And also it makes the possibility to contract uh, these three hospitals. And then if we have more hospitals that will be contacted through this uh, instruction. So and the instruction is, an, um, it includes what, uh, the model of care says, so it uh, incorporates this uh, comprehensive care for, for trans people, also define the criteria for access to both the hormone treatment and also the um, treatment for the surgery, and to designate these three hospitals that you have seen before. So we have two documents, the model of care, and then we created another document uh, to, to join these three hospitals and to agree how they have to do this body um, surgical modification. So they are working together in this point. So the key elements I have um, already uh, said that explained that this non-pathological vision, uh, the, companion, the companionship during all the transition, since the first moment they, they go to the community level to ask for, for help or for the hormonation or just for emotional support. And then the surgical body modification with three hospitals. We monitor the surgical process and also uh, we, we contract a certain number of sur um, body modifications or surgical interventions. So now what we're including in, the, in this portfolio is the vaginoplasty, stereotomy, mastectomy with masculinization, and also glottoplasty. What comes next? So we are pending now from a review of the law, which is being prepared by the Ministry of Health in, in Spain. And this new law, if it is approved, uh, they will provide this model of care for all Spain, but also they will, um, they will uh, include new public services, uh, uh, access to human assisted reproduction. We have this also already in, in Catalonia. They have no problem. We do not any discrimination. And also they will include uh, fertility preservation, but it has to be still approved. So this is the scenario when we have this community-based model just here in Barcelona, and we want to uh, provide the access all through the, the, the community. So we have been extending um, new points of care. So we have now four more points, and we are covering all these areas, but, uh, and this is progressive, and we have this, these three hospitals, all of them are coordinated. And our next steps will be to provide this access through almost all the community. Why not in the north? Because we have identified that we have very, very few people here. We will train professionals there, but uh, they, uh, they are very few people and all the needs, they, they specific needs they, they, they have here, they go through Lleida. So we have a care point there and they are happy with that. So, Okay, and this is at a glance the model of care that we have uh, prepared and is dynamic and we are still working on that. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, uh, be happy. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. We continue now with Dr. Daniel Moreno Martinez. 
He is the head of the innovation program at Hospital German Trias, Institute de Cali Catala de la Salud, Spain. Yes. Uh, Very he nice. holds a PhD on molecular biology from Manchester Metropolitan University in the United Kingdom. He leads now the innovation management process at the German hospital, one of the major Catalan health institute hospitals. And he is going to present driving international healthcare transformation through a collaborative innovation and entrepreneurship program. Yes. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And I would like to start by thanking the organizers and the scientific committee for giving me the opportunity to share with you some of the work that we've been doing uh, in our hospital around driving international healthcare transformation through collaboration. Uh, so my name is Dr. Daniel Moreno Martinez, and I'm the head of the innovation program at Hospital German Strias y Pujol, which uh, you may know uh, is part of the Catalan Health Institute, which is the largest healthcare provider here in Catalonia. And we are one of the three major uh, hospitals in Barcelona belonging to the Catalan Health Institute. We're actually located in the north of the city, and we are part of a large research campus where the hospital sits, but also does a number of other research organizations, most notably uh, Institut German Strias uh, y Pujol, whom we work very close with. Um, so what I'm presenting to you today is really a transition from the classic innovation management model in our hospitals, whereby those hospitals trust the research institutes and tech transfer offices to the complete management of research, innovation, and research projects, to a model whereby we are able to embed part of the activities of such innovation management <clears throat> inside the structure of the hospital in order to provide focused support to the, to the hospital processes and needs. And why do we need to do this? Uh, not just in a Catalan hospital, but I believe in any hospital really, so that we can redefine the model, we can advance ourselves to the future and we can harvest in-house knowledge that's available inside the hospitals. And we've been doing this and implementing this innovation strategy for a number of years. We've been doing this uh, very much aligned with that top-down uh, top strategy with the support of senior management through the creation of an innovation direction and the deployment of the innovation program as a strategic tool which has been working to plan, implement and consolidate a number of um, apologies because this went a number of, um, of activities throughout the last years. And among those activities there is the Healthcare Entrepreneur Exchange Program uh, HIP for short, which is the one I've got the pleasure of presenting to you today. So what's HIP? HIP is a program built and implemented in collaboration between our hospital and the Leeds Teaching Hospital in the UK, aiming at fostering entrepreneurship and international collaboration between healthcare professionals. I've got a promotional video for the program for you to watch. Uh, video, I, I like it a lot. Um, but basically, all it says, uh, all, all that the video said is that we, we ran an innovation idea competition in our hospital and in Leeds Hospital, and we did this in parallel. We accepted projects until the end of October 2020. Out of the projects that we received, we selected six from our hospital and six from, from Leeds Hospital. And those 12 projects participated in a number of training and mentoring activities in order to build a case study, which they defended <clears throat> at the end of March in a sort of demo day. Now, out of that demo day, there were three winners from each hospital, three winners from our hospital and three winners from Leeds. 
each of those winners received 10,000 10, euros each to start working on, on their projects. And they also got the opportunity to spend one week in each other's location. So the three winners from Barcelona spent one week in Leeds and the three winners from Leeds spent one week in Barcelona. The objective of that was to connect each other's healthcare innovation ecosystems and start working together. So just to give you a flavor of the sort of projects that we identified in our hospital and from our perspective, we had the opportunity to identify two projects around software and, in, and artificial intelligence, three projects around medical device, one of them around sustainability, green economy. But what, what I think is most important is the impact of such projects. Now, all, all, uh, we, we've got six potential patents or utility models, six functional uh, minimum viable products, six collaboration agreements, and we've already submitted half of those projects to other competitive funding sources. I think is, is quite a success for, for, such a, for such a small program. I mentioned also that the winners from each location had the opportunity to spend one week abroad. This happened uh, very recently, just a couple of weeks ago, we finalized this sort of exchange. And the objective of such business, which was basically to connect the north of the UK and Barcelona healthcare innovation ecosystems in order to showcase strengths and build valuable connections, not just among the hospitals, but also among the different organizations based in each, in each uh, location. Yes, some pictures to, uh, just to show you how fun it was and uh, you know, uh, how, how enjoy enjoyable it was, but we really had a blast. It was really fun and we are definitely going to repeat this. Uh, and this is just to showcase, uh, you know, the number of, of organizations that were somehow uh, involved in the organization of the program and in the, you know, in running those, those, uh, those, those international weeks, if you want to say it that way. And here we can see some of the organizations that somehow provided support uh, during the visit of the British delegation to Spain. And here we can see some of the organizations that provided support during the visit of the Spanish guys to, 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 to the UK. So our work highlights, really, the importance of establishing innovation support units within healthcare settings, the benefits in offering educational and mentoring programs to support entrepreneurship in hospitals, the impact that structured offerings have on the capture of early stage projects in, in hospitals. And so, in summary, our work has contributed to identify several innovation leaders and ambassadors internationally across two healthcare systems, to accelerate a relevant number of projects with a clear route to market, to motivate further healthcare professionals to inquire about other innovation supporting activities. And it has also prompted hospital leadership to provide further support to the innovation activities, which is obviously uh, much needed. And what we've got here is a small program uh, that ran this year with the participation of just a couple of hospitals, but that's easily scalable. And we are hoping to repeat this next year, either every year or every couple of years, including more, more hospitals uh, in, in the mix, not just here in, in Catalonia, but also elsewhere in the north of, of the UK. Uh, and I'd like to finish by thanking everybody that's been involved uh, in the execution uh, of, of the HIP program, uh, most, uh, most especially uh, Dr. Chris McKee, who is Business Development and Innovation Manager in Leeds, but also to everyone in our team here in Barcelona and everyone in the team also uh, uh, in, the, in the UK. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions you may have at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Such an innovation project. Um, our fifth presentation is um, from Brazil. Uh, a singular partnership between civil society and government, matching good will with professional governance to provide high complex pediatric care uh, and Erika Bomer Cagliari. She is Director of Strategy and Innovation at Brasilia Children's Hospital, Brazil. She's postgraduate in Quality and Health Services Management, specialist in accreditation systems. Uh, she has been working for more than 10 years developing patient-centered management models. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm um, really happy to share with you a little bit of our history and experience. Um, uh, our hospital is located at the capital of Brazil. 
Brasilia is a young and modern city which was recognized by UNESCO as National Historical Heritage Site. Uh, it would be a pleasure to, to welcome for a visit. Um, and the hospital, né? Hospital da Criança de Brasília, is a public institution whose mission is to assist children and teenagers with chronic and complex disorders. Exclusively to the public health system, known as Sistema Único de Saúde, SUS. Uh, healthcare in Brazil is a constitutional right, and SUS is considered one of the largest and most complex public uh, healthcare system uh, in the world. Uh, since the 1990, it should guarantee universal and free access to healthcare for the entire population, covering from simple to high um, complex Sorry, complex medical procedure, a challenge that uh, requires uh, good governance and innovations in health management models. The hospital was built in two stages. The first, uh, destined to outpatient care, was opened in 2011, and the second, destined to inpatient care, was opened in 2018. We have more than 200 inpatient beds, 38 uh, of which for intensive care, uh, eight surgery rooms uh, with the possibility of carrying out transplants, 30 medical offices as well as hemodialysis, hemotherapy, chemotherapy, imaging services, among others, and areas for education and research. We have medical residence programs, special areas for in training service, uh, in service training, uh, trans translational, translational uh, research lab, including hematological cytology, immu uh, immunophenotyping, molecular biology, and molecular serogenetics. Uh, the hospital participates in many research projects and maintain technical scientific cooperations with important institutions in Brazil and abroad, uh, such as San Juan, uh, San, San Juan de uh, Barcelona, uh, Hopital Necker, uh, Paris, uh, Sick Children's Hospital, Toronto, and St. Jude's Global Alliance, um, for example, and more. No? We more than 50, uh, we more than 1,500 employees, and the hospital uh, has quality certification recognized by the International Society of, for Quality in Healthcare, ISQA. And our facilities were designed to provide a humanized environment. We used to say that we have a singular operating model. Because community, uh, government, and families came together to improve care in specialized pediatrics. In summary, our hospital was born uh, from community uh, and was built with society donation. It's managed, managed uh, by a no-profit civil organization and, as I said before, uh, it's finan financed exclusively, through, uh, ex exclusively by public resources in a successful public-private partnership. Brasilia didn't have dedicated structure to take care of children with cancer and other complex disorders. Uh, these patients were treated at the City Man Public Hospital, which was the reference for the emergence. In addition to the fact that specialized, specialized pediatric care was not a priority, uh, there was often a lack of material, medications, and extractor to carry out the procedures, compromise the, the outcomes. Uh, this situation was the drive for a group constituted by affected families and healthcare professionals um, to create a no governmental organization called ABRAS, uh, Assistance to Families of Children uh, with Cancer and Hemopathies, to improve the conditions of care. Years later, this group convinced the local government about the necessity to have a pediatric hospital, uh, a hospital that could be managed by an innovative partnership. After count uh, countless attempts, 
uh, they got permission to build a hospital in a public land, mobilized the uh, community to raise funds, they built, equipped, and donate the outpatient building to the local government. Then Abrice stabilized, uh, established a second no-profit organization, ECP, Children Cancer Institute and Specialized Pediatrics, to manage the hospital. This voluntary organization is composed by patients' parents and acknowledged professionals as a doctor and experience managers from both public and private institutions. The ECP managed the hospital through a management agreement, whereas the funds transfers are attached uh, to the achievement's specific goals. Um, the hospital has completely changed the model of pediatric care in Brazil since, since the beginning. Uh, you, can, you can see this, the, the structure. And this is the hospital some image, and uh, we are able to provide specialized, specialized and multidisciplinary care in a happy and lively environment, as you can see in these pictures. Um, at a glance, our model of care is based on the clinic management in um, in a broad and interdisciplinary manner with the involvement of the patient and their family in the care process. We have more than 80 humanization actions, an amazing voluntary program, self-care groups, and many other patient-centered uh, initiatives. Um, this, is, this management mandala reflects our governance model. The patient is the center of our attention. Uh, to whom we offer diagnosis, treatment, follow-up, education, and research uh, through three lines of care, clinical, surgical, and oncomatological, uh, performed by, by all of us. Uh, we believe that everyone has the same importance to deliver care and experience, and we are aligned with the institutional values. Um, our care structure uh, allowed many achievements, such as complex surgeries, transplant, more than 6,000 medical appointments per month, treatment of around 250 new cases of cancer a year, for example, and happiness and successions at work are measured uh, by an annual survey. We have sustained high levels of employee success, satisfaction. Uh, who are very proud to work uh, in our institution and about the way it contributes to society. Uh, to ensure transparency and efficiency uh, in allocation of resources is one of premise, premise for the sustainability and success of partnership. In addition to the rigorous ver verification of compliance by control agents, uh, through audits and analysis of a monthly reports issue, we disclose for all stakeholders production numbers, costs, and other relevant information. Um, everything is done to ensure that the child can just be a child in any situation or circumstance. And we are providing heal, care, and comfort, and allowing community to believe there are those who care about what matters to you. Organized and participatory community can transform realities and quality public health is completely possible. I, I finish my presentation with this quote by Mr. Tedros, Tedros Adhanom during one of his visits to our hospital. Without any exaggeration, this hospital could easily serve as a model for other countries for the world. Thanks for your attention, and I hope to see you in Brazil. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we continue towards the end of our presentations uh, with Professor Joana Feijó. 
She is business developer director at the Health Cluster Portugal, and she is going to talk about the Portuguese registry of clinical outcomes in cataract surgery, first report and next steps. Joana Feijó holds a degree in microbiology from the Catholic University, a master's degree in basic and molecular biology, and a PhD in biomedical sciences. Uh, so. Thank you, uh, Professor Joanna, the floor is yours. Thank you, good morning to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so, oh, this is not the, the last version, sorry. Can you update it or I can do it? Sorry. So I, I will I will start. Sorry. Do you have it a pen drive? No, no I, I update it in this. You don't have it? Okay. Put it the one that you have. No problem. I update it in the central okay. IT. No problem. So um, Health Cluster Portugal. Here is the the cluster of uh, healthcare. Uh, we we are a private nonprofit association founded in 2018. And nowadays we have more than 200 um, associations, associators. Um, we work with all the value chain of healthcare from R&D institutions, academia, private and public hospitals, industry like pharma, medical devices, equipment, biotech and other. And what we do, we, we work by uh, working with a triangle of companies, R&D institutions and care providers creating an ecosystem that, that drives uh, new products and services that, were, that can be innovative and promote exportations, better uh, healthcare in Portugal. Sorry, Be uh, better healthcare provider in Portugal. Um, uh, and also uh, to promote uh, Portuguese um, products uh, worldwide. Sorry. So we started in 2017 a project uh, with the objective to promote value-based healthcare models uh, implementation in Portugal. We start with a, a, a specific speciality that is ophthalmology with cataract surgery. Uh, and the main objectives of these projects were these five. So first of all, evaluate the, clinic, the performance of different uh, clinical uh, ophthalmology centers in Portugal, validating the efficiency and maintaining the costs or lesser the costs, create value for the patients in a culture of self-assessment and improvement, to provide payers information uh, to have better decisions on the payments on, on healthcare, mostly based on value and not, not on, on volume, create an ecosystem of collaboration between clinicians and uh, scientific uh, researchers in order to create new products and services, and also, of course, to recognize externally the, the, the excellence of Portuguese uh, excellence on ophthalmology. We started this, this project uh, creating a private-public partnership, and this was a very interesting way to do it. Uh, we uh, put together more than 13 private and, and, and public hospitals in Portugal, the most important ones, uh, the most relevant ones. We, we were um, cherished by the Portuguese government, mainly by the healthcare and m uh, economy ministry on, on this initiative because they think that we will uh, completely drive the, the acceptance of value-based payments, procurement, and care provider in Portugal. We make a partnership with HITESHOM, uh, that is the International Consortium for Healthcare Outcomes Measurement. It's a recognized uh, uh, consortium that have data sets to collect patient reported outcomes and clinic, clinical outcomes, um, ve very structured. We also made a partnership with a Portuguese startup that is called Promptly. And we 
bring to the ecosystem different industry partners in order to understand their needs and in order to understand how can we change the model of procurement and payment in Portugal. As I said, we, we, we are working with Hydesham. Why? Because it's the most used uh, uh, data set, a cataract data set uh, worldwide. They are uh, implemented in more than 70 sites all, all over the world. And the data sets, uh, the patient reported outcome data set includes a lot of interesting factors that impacts the quality of life of the patient. Also, the, the data set of Hydesham is very simple because it only have two data points of, uh, data, points of data collection, one before the surgery and uh, one after the surgery within three months. Promptly, so promptly it, it, was, it is a startup uh, and four years ago it is starting on this field. Uh, we, we develop with them a platform that allows uh, the clinical outcomes questionnaire to be digitalized and so the clinicians work directly in the platform and also they have a, a mobile platform for patients to fulfill the CAT quest, so the patient reported outcome questionnaire uh, directly in their mobile phones or tablets when prescribed by the, by the physician. And here you have the journey of the project. So I, we started in 2007, 2018, with the concept of, uh, of the conceptualization of the project. In 2018, we developed the IT platform. And we, in 2019, we have a pilot with three centers with more than 5,000 patients. In the end of 2020, we published the first report of the project, including 13 uh, um, uh, care, care providers, and we start doing the internal benchmarking. In 2022, we are starting with a new pathology that is macular degeneration, and we are starting to collect costs in cataract. Briefly, uh, our annual report uh, was uh, uh, made with more than uh, 11,000 patients with a social demographic characteristics similar to, those, to others on uh, other European registries and Swedish, Swedish registry, with an average uh, follow-up rate of clinical outcomes of 63% and patient reported outcomes of 62%. Uh, in Portugal, what we saw is that the, the condition of the patient before surgery is worse than other countries, but after uh, surgery, we have uh, um, a post-operative uh, uh, visual acuity similar to other countries. In Portugal, we are using uh, a lot more premium lenses, more, uh, mostly uh, toric lenses than other co European countries. Regarding patient reported outcomes, what you can see is uh, the, the perceived uh, quality of life of patients in Portugal is more or less similar to other uh, patients in other countries. Uh, and uh, what we can see, and it is interesting, is that what clinicians perceive is different from what patients perceive. So clinicians perceive a better uh, a status of the patient than the patient, and also that the time where we collect patient reported outcomes is important. If it, the, we do this uh, between 30 uh, days after the surgery, the results reported are worse if, than if we uh, hear patients after 13 days. This project was recognized for, by the Global Coalition for Value in Healthcare from the World uh, Economic Forum has a, a mature pilot that can be serve as a proof of concept for these value-based implementation projects. Uh, and also uh, last month we were invited to be part of the uh, value payments community also of the World Economic Forum. Um, next steps, um, or before next steps, maybe the challenge, challenges, well, I don't have here the slide, but the most important challenges were to implement the clinical reported outcomes collection in the patient pathway that is already established in the hospital. Uh, the best practice could, should be to have this questionnaire in, embedded in the electronic medical record. However, this is not possible 
in mostly of the Portuguese hospitals because they are um, governmental hospitals and have le uh, legacy and old systems that have no interoperability with these new platforms. So this has been a challenging, what we have done to override it is to have a tool like copy paste uh, from the questionnaire to the electronic medical record. Regarding patient reported outcomes in this specific pathology that uh, affects mostly elderly people and for excluded people, we have a problem, a problem on uh, uh, the, the, full, the filling of the questionnaire. The best case which would be when physician prescribes the patient reported outcome, the patient goes to his uh, mobile phone and reports. But what is happening now is that we have tablets on waiting rooms of the hospitals and some resources, administrative resources, helping these patients to report uh, outcomes. Going further, so next steps. Um, we are uh, expanding the project for new care centers in Portugal. We are introducing new pathologies, as I said, macular generation, and on the next year we would like to go to cardiovascular. We have been introducing in Hydrome data sets some specific metrics for the Portuguese case. We are working with Hydrome to go to the international benchmarking platform. Uh, we are conceptualizing a way to give to Portuguese patients a benchmarking platform so they can choose the hospital where they want to be uh, have surgery. We will start uh, an economic analysis uh, based on the TDABC model on cataract surgery. Uh, and we are working with pharma industry and medical devices industry on uh, specific procurement and funding uh, models for these pathologies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Joana. Uh, and now our last speaker is Dr. Teresa Sanchez. Uh, she is the head of strategic initiatives at Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia, Spain. She is a PhD in physics with a master in leadership and management of science. Uh, welcome again. The floor is yours. Well, thank you and thank you everybody for being here with me today. Uh, in this talk, I would like to introduce you to, uh, the strategy of the Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia to contribute to the medicine of the 21st century based on bioengineering. I have prepared this presentation with Josep Samitier, director of IBEC. I would like to start by introducing bioengineering. Bioengineering, here you can see a definition, is the application of engineering principles of design and analysis to biological systems and biomedical technologies. This is a highly interdisciplinary field where physics, biology, chemistry, maths, ICT, engineering are combined to study biological systems and develop novel solutions for health. Uh, um, bioengineering is already benefiting uh, millions of patients in the clinics today, as you can see here with uh, robotic surgery, um, medical imaging such as NMR, uh, high-tech prosthesis and implant, stents, etc. And more recently, bioengineering has also proven to be a very powerful tool against COVID-19. Some examples would be the vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer are, are using nanoengineering uh, nanoparticles to deliver mRNA to, to cells. Also, the use of organoids to test drugs against SARS-CoV-2 the use of uh, biomedical signal processing and big data to uh, diagnose and stratify COVID patients, or the use of 3D bioprinting for the fast and tailored production of ventilation equipment or PPEs uh, during the most dramatic month of the pandemic. Uh, we, in IBEC, we are convinced that bio engineering is going to transform healthcare in the 21st century, taking full advantage of uh, the so-called smart health, where uh, ICT and biotechnology is going to uh, 
help us to achieve um, a predictive um, precision medicine with the use of technologies such as virtual reality, um, sorry, mobile, 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 nanotechnology, artificial intelligence, synthetic biology, sensors, 3D bioprinting, genome editing, or uh, advanced drug delivery systems. From IVEC, we want to be part and lead this transformation of healthcare. Here, I would like to briefly introduce IVEC. The Institute for Bioengineering of Catalonia is a research center based here in, in Barcelona. We work at the interface between life science and engineering in, in four targeted areas of knowledge, nanomedicine, cell biomechanics, cell engineering, and ICT for health. We have four, sorry, three main research uh, uh, health res focus programs by Engineering for Active Aging, where we want to develop solutions to improve life of uh, an elderly population, by Engineering for Regenerative Therapies, where we develop cell th therapies and implants for the regeneration of damaged tissues and organs, and also by engineering for future medicines, where our goal is to introduce in the clinical practice novel technologies to achieve precision medicine, such as photopharmacology, organ on chip, mechanobiology, or nanorobotics. Here are some figures about, about the institute. We have uh, around uh, 370 researchers in, in 22 research groups, and we combine basic research with publications and projects like ERC grants with a drive for technology transfer and clinical translation. And in our 15 years of experience, we have filed 14, 40 patents and uh, created four spin-offs. And as said, our final goal is to, uh, by engineering solutions for health, to achieve a, a better health for everybody and sustainable health healthcare system with cost-effective solutions. Yeah. To achieve this, we need to overcome that barriers that limit the clinical translation of novel bioengineering technologies. Some of them would be that bioengineering is not always included in the curricula of healthcare professionals. The lack of synergies between clinicians, researchers, and uh, the industry the lack of collaboration schemes for the jointly development of therapies and diagnostic tools, and the lack of a clear pathway for novel technologies to be incorporated in the healthcare system. So we are convinced that we need to, to progress towards an open innovation system, uh, model where all the actors involved in the health innovation work together. Uh, the strategic plan of IBEC is, is designed to try to overcome these, these barriers, and translation is one of its four pillars. So um, from an organizational leadership structure, we have set up a clinical innovation and translation committee to, that advises IBEC on how to meet the needs of the hospital <coughs> sectors. And we have appointed a deputy director for clinical innovation and translation. We have also tried to attract clinicians to, to the center with, by different means. Um, what we call the clinicians in residence. We have a program of, of, of associated clinicians where uh, relevant clinicians in the field can become formally associated to IBEC so, and then can participate in our training program and in our translational projects. We also, we also want to incorporate uh, doctors to the lab and we have a visiting programs for consolidated professionals, and, and we are designing a program po for post-hospital medical trainees, so people who has just finished the um, specialty at the hospital. And also we have a clinical immersion program where we link PhD students with clinicians as mentors, so that each PhD student has a, a, a clinical mentor that uh, advises on them on the clinical aspects of their research. Our facilities and services are also aligned with our translation strategy. Currently, we have a microfab space, which is part of a national ICTS um, facility called Nanbiosis um, 
coordinated by Cyber BBN, where we offer to hospitals and, and companies microfabrication and characterization services of biomedical related devices. And more recently, our unit of uh, biomodels and 3D bioprinting for uh, disease modeling and drug screening has been selected by the National Institute uh, de Salud Carlos III to be part of the national platform of biobanks and, and biomodels, which is also coordinated from IBEC by Professor Nuria Monserrat. Regarding the ecosystem, as said, I, we think it's crucial to, to establish links with hospitals and in this sense we are working to create joint units, joint P, um, PhD thesis and joint postdoctoral researchers, especially with Hospital by the Ebron, but also with others. And we have also a triple I mobility program for, uh, for, for states of our personnel at hospitals and medtech companies. We have also signed a cooperation agreement with the official College of Doctors of, of Barcelona to link bioengineers and clinicians at different levels. And thanks to this, we are in close contact with uh, clinicians that are referenced in their fields, and we use them as key opinion leaders to validate date event invention and also accept as experts in the interdisciplinary events for discussion and networking that we regularly organize, such as the Nano World Cancer Day or, or, nan, or the Nano Rare Disease Days. We organize these events through the Spanish platform for nanomedicine, which is also coordinated by IBEC. Nanomed Spain gathers over 170 institutions including research centers, industry, hospitals, uh, administrations, and policy makers, with the aim of accelerate the uptake in the markets and the clinic of nanomedicine and bioengineering. Regarding tech transfer and entrepreneurship, we have created four spin-offs, as I said, and we really promote entrepreneurship among our staff with training and also, for instance, with the innovation days that we organize yearly in the framework of EIT Health, and also with our open, innova open innovation labs, where we invite entrepreneurs to our institute to develop ideas and new projects for unmet clinical needs. We currently have a, a open lab on bioengineering and reproductive health, and we are working to open new, new labs. And with this, I'm going to finish my presentation. I hope I have convinced you that bioengineering has the power to change healthcare and medicine in the near future. But that to do this, we need to work together to overcome all the barriers that limit this innovation. From IBEC, we really believe in this, and we want to work with the community, and this has been our experience, but I would love to uh, share with you others and to, to discuss with you other ideas and, and things that we can share. So thank you. Thank you very much. We now have uh, 10 minutes or so for a discussion. Uh, I would like to know if anyone in the room have any questions from the audience. As you know, we have several people online, and I have here four questions. Um, as three of them are about innovation, I am going to uh, just pick one of those, and I will uh, show you the other one. Um, to some degree, innovation is easy. So this is for the Innovation Institute. Um, to some degree, innovation is easy. How do you anticipate adoption of your innovations? Innovation without adoption is relatively worthless. Could you... If you mind, if you don't mind, you come either to that microphone, yes, the Innovation Institute, either to, my, to that microphone yeah. or to the table. Yeah. Do you want to have a seat? Yeah. Can I sit there? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
So could you, so the question was about adoption. Yes, mainly, yeah, yes. I think, I think that's a good question. Um, let me clarify. Do you mind to take your? Let me clarify uh, something for you, and I think that's key. Uh, I'm, I'm not representing the institute, I'm representing the hospital, which is more important for mm -hmm. adoption. And actually the objective, of the, one of the main objectives of the innovation program that we put in place in our hospital, which I think is quite unique looking at the Catalan uh, healthcare uh, space and even looking abroad, uh, is to encourage the adoption, is to create the right settings so that everybody wants to embrace change and is keen to listen about new technologies and is keen to explore strategies for adoption. Yes, so but do you have any strategy? How The question is how do you anticipate adoption? So we have to we have to put systems in. We have to create the structures in the hospital mm -hmm. to support this process. Mm -hmm. If we don't create the right structures inside the hospitals to support this process, and we expect existing structures to do this work, it will not happen. Mm -hmm. That's why I insist having innovation programs in the hospitals that take place, that um, sorry, take care of ensuring that whenever a technology arrives, is put in place and is measured. Its impact is measured, and uh, you know. Uh, it's managed in a structured way. That's that's a that's a key that's a that's a key uh, instrument. Yeah. It's like having a diagnosis of cancer and not having the treatment. Uh, yeah. For the disease. Yeah, yes. Did. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you may thank you may stay if you want. Okay. Um, the other question is about cataracts and the carbon. I'm going to read it. Could you imagine a quality metric? of carbon emissions per procedure on cataracts, for example. I don't know if you want to help answering. Both of you could try to answer. If you don't mind to take a seat here. I will need your help to answer this. <laughs> I so the process, question. the process to introduce the, uh, another uh, measure, it's it's not difficult. It's easy. Uh, I don't know which measure should be introduced to measure uh, this kind of thing. Sorry. Yeah, I actually asked the question, <laughs> so it was a trick in some ways. Um, no, I just you know it, one of the things that we're trying to do is to think about how do we start to. Um, use carbon as one of the, the quality metrics. And I just, I, I liked your research was so specific around, you know, one particular clinical pathway. I think it would be very interesting to collaborate. I should do this in a different way maybe and, and see how we could do that as a model for other clinical pathways. Yeah, uh, um, so uh, uh, we start with, with uh, cataract surgery just as a a simple step, yes. so it's easy to, to do it, let's do it like this. Yes. The objective is to turn this to a, a different pathologies. Uh, introduce different quality of uh, measure, measures, I think it's, it's interesting and we can start a collaboration right. here. <laughs> One of the interesting things about uh, decarbonization and is, well to me at least, uh, was about metrics. It's very important to measure uh, to measure what we do now and what we'll do in the future, introducing new ways of doing uh, healthcare. And um, actually, uh, it is very important to know that you are really interested on measuring. Yes. Uh, and obviously, these two <laughs> presentations, uh, also all, all of them, but these two presentations could match quite easily and um, could be a project, why not, yeah. uh, to introduce the decarbonization. And the one question I had here about the decarbonization is how can we do it? And if you have any experiences on barriers that could have in the field, and in order to have something more light, you could give us some good ideas also, not only barriers and challenges, difficult challenge, we could also have uh, new things that arise easily for people. Wow, well, if I had all of those answers, right, I would be at <laughs> COP26 at Glasgow giving them, I guess. Um, 
you know, it is not an easy problem, the decarbonization problem. It's extremely complex. Uh, I, I think one thing that's important to say about that is to not be overwhelmed by the immensity of the, of the challenge because it's easy to, I think, um, to give up and to despair. And that is something that we cannot afford to do, right? And so the, the first easy thing in some ways is to, uh, to pay attention and to commit. Um, one of the things that I have learned and I have seen in healthcare organizations around the world is that when they pay attention and when they start to measure and when they start, they start to see opportunities because the opportunities are all around us in terms of what we can do in, in how we behave, how we uh, procure, how we operate. And, and in many regards, the people on the ground doing the work have the answers. And, and often they want to do something and they're motivated to do it, but they don't feel like leaders care or that there's room for them. And so in some ways, as leaders of healthcare organizations, the simplest thing we can do is to start to pay attention and to empower our people and change will come. Thank you. Um, just another question and maybe it's the final question. We have three minutes. For the innovation person, how will you accomplish, ado oh, again, adoption, sorry. Uh, the other one is um, the innovation program includes one project on sustainability. Yes. Can you please describe it? Oh, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's one of the projects that were identified as part of the uh, innovation ideas uh, competition. And, and this was about uh, uh, ensuring that we can modify the uh, spaces in the emergency care world so that we could adopt, adapt it quickly uh, to circumstances. And this was mostly around shelving, so storage space in the emergency department. And I cannot disclose much because we are in the process of protecting this, but we basically come up with a system which is sort of IKEA-like. It's quite cool. And I'm not sure why IKEA hasn't come up with this yet, but I think they will. Because <laughs> uh, uh, in a very simple manner, with just a nail on the wall, you can build uh, any sort of shelf you know, mm -hmm. uh, with our system, which is really, really, you know, it really much, uh, it very much sorts a problem that we have, at least in our hospitals in Catalonia, which is space, mm -hmm. you know, and adapting the space to the needs real quick. So I'm sorry I cannot disclose any further about that project, but I would encourage uh, whoever asked the question to, to keep an eye on, on what we do within the next few months. Okay, thank you. Anyone from the audience, any question? Okay. Oh, there's one question. Just one minute. <laughs> there was a question in there for her too. Yeah, I would like, I would like to ask Walt about this uh, thing because in in IBEC we have started also to to try to to address this issue and we have built a strategy for sustainability. But this has been like a mixed bottom-up, top-down thing. So I, I don't mm. know which is the, the, the best option. We created with volunteers a committee for sustainable research with all kind of stuff. But at the same time, uh, people from the direction of the institute were involved in this committee. So this has been like a mixed thing. And I don't know if you think this is a good way or it must be better to start really from the direction of the Institute of Health? It, it, it's a great question. I, you know, I think um, uh, having both is much better, obviously, <laughs> right? And having the combination is much better. And so uh, uh, I celebrate that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you the pre for the presenters. Thank you, all of you. We are all getting tired, so this is the last day of a very important Congress. I'm sure all of you enjoyed it very much. So have a safe journey home. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you.